question is, have you personally had any evidence uh, that we have choice about reincarnation and in the planning of our lives? Yeah, what we know of ourselves, of our personality, our lives, our family, uh, what we think we are from the moment we have been brought into the world when we were born, um, and grown up and educated and things like that. This is only about, what, 20, 30, 50, 80 years. There's a very small uh, period in which to build up an understanding of who we are. But what we are here on this planet is only the tip of the iceberg. It's only a minute, minute part of who we are. We may think, oh, we have got a really, really hard time. We are chronically ill, we are in constant pain. I, this life is just too much for us. I never want to come back here. There's always suffering. There's so much misery. I want to get out. I never want to come back to this life ever again. And that's understandable. But we have to bear in mind that what we experience is only perhaps 2% of what we are. And when we get into our real self, when we get into our true identity and our consciousness expands, we suddenly realize that we, have, that we are so much more than this little person on this earth. We are much more and there's so much more to us and, and suddenly everything becomes quite insignificant when we look at it from, from this uh, perspective. So, um, so, yeah, we cannot make a decision from our limited self of whether we want to be reincarnated or not. So, uh, so yeah, so the, the thing is, basically, we are the tip of the iceberg. And we have very little idea of what is hidden uh, underneath it. And so we cannot make an informed decision from our current viewpoint. And when we get to a higher state of consciousness, we get a much better impression of what we need to know, what we need to learn, and, and uh, you know, the people we want to meet. And I have met people who, um, who have refused to reincarnate, because they were so impregnated with their past experience, which was so vivid in their minds, uh, that they um, simply couldn't bring themselves to, to start another incarnation. There were other people who had a very clear picture of what they wanted to be and what they wanted to do, and that was sometimes informed by a previous experience they only recently had. When their last incarnation was, uh, let's say, uh, only a short time ago, maybe, uh, they reincarnated when they <clears throat> only died about 20 years before, or 10 years, and they were very still, still very impregnated with the memory and the, the desires and the needs which they didn't really have much opportunity to explore. So th very often these people bring, are motivated by these short-term memory experience into a new life. I remember <clears throat> one woman I spoke to, she wanted to become a shop assistant. And she was, she was uh, obsessed with the idea. And I spoke to her and I was very moved by uh, her um, rather modest ambition. But that was something she always dreamt of. So there wasn't much space passed between the incarnation so it was almost like an extension of her previous life she was seeking. But what I'm, what I'm driving at is that when we get into a higher state of consciousness, we suddenly remember there's a lot more to us. And then when we get a b better overview of our lives, we make a more informed decision of the things we really need to learn, which we may have missed and the people we, we, we need to meet. So it's a, it's a complex process and we can't just say, okay, um, because our life was so bad, we don't want to reincarnate again. When we get a, 
a bigger view of it, we may think, oh, it wasn't so bad. You know, I've learned these things and I learned other things and uh, I've got a lot more to learn. And then we may change our mind and voluntarily return. So, yeah, so that's that. Here's another question, which is interesting. Have you seen evidence that people visit the astral world while they are asleep or in a coma? Are you able to see the silver cord of sleepers or out-of-body experiences? Um, but my personal experience is that I'm not very often aware of the silver cord. Although I've seen it in myself, I've seen it in other people, and I have seen, I've witnessed people pointing it out to me that I had a silver cord when I was not even aware of it. So that's not, that is usually the silver cord is an energy, um, energy stream which connects us to the physical body. And, and very often this stream can be very fine or almost imperceptible. But, but there is, in my experience and in the experience of others, they have been aware of it, but some people have been more aware than others and some people haven't paid any attention to it at all. But you, we have to bear in mind that if people are in a coma, and people sleep and they say, I sleep but I don't dream, Consciousness, consciousness never sleeps. Consciousness is always awake, is always aware, you know. So, so we may be in a coma, our body may be in a coma, but our consciousness is hyper aware, hyper alert. It may not be directly connected to our body, but it doesn't sleep. I went through a period of time when I was in a hyper state of awareness, where I, where I didn't dream, where I didn't sleep. I, I watched myself being asleep. I watched myself even dreaming. I saw myself dreams. I, I saw my dreams, but I was watching it from the outside. So I, I saw myself asleep, but my consciousness was hyper alert. And my lower nature, my astral consciousness, my emotional self was asleep and was dreaming. And I watched me dreaming. And that's interesting. And that gave me the, the knowledge that consciousness never sleeps. You know, so, so yeah, we're always, always aware. So we've just got time for the last question. Um, yeah, what, what am I looking forward to to working on in 2022? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm an artist first, really, and, and I'm, I'm not a teacher. Uh, I like to bring my experiences to life. Uh, sometimes I, I can do it with words. But I'm sort of focused on pictures, really, and that's what I want to do. Uh, that is my, my main motivation, and I think it's somehow my role in life to, to bring the experience, make them uh, present for other people who are interested. It's not, I don't think I'm anything special, you know, any, anybody who is sort of going to make a great impact Otherwise, I would sell more books, you know, than I do. But but that's not important. What is important that I see myself as a grain of sand, you know, and we all are. We all think we are special, and we are. We are all special, but everybody is special, and we are all grains of sand, you know. And I see myself in this context, so everybody does a little bit, and most of all, we do our bit to fulfill ourselves, to find joy in life, you know, to find something that gives us a sense of fulfillment, of, of worth. And I think, I mean, just doing little things can be very fulfilling, like talking to the shop assistant or to the policeman, the postman, 
giving them a smile, you know, talking about uh, the weather, <laughs> all these things are the small things, but if we involve our heart uh, and to reach out to people, then we are fulfilling a very important aspect of of who we are, because we're not just individuals living on islands, we are social species. You know, we are only human when we really connect with other people. And that's how I see it, and that's why I, I feel really happy that I don't have to be anything special, and I can relax in life. I don't have to stand out from the crowd, I don't have any pressure, you know, nobody can make me do anything I don't want to do. And, and in this modest little sphere of my world, that is what I want to do. You know, just be like everybody else, do my thing, and hopefully other people will also participate in the joy it gives me, really. So, yeah, uh, that's basically <laughs> my closing statement. If I'm going to write something again, uh, which I may do, I, I haven't made any plans. I've got a lot of material in my notebooks, um, but I, I feel it's got to be uh, coming almost automatically, you know, because I cannot uh, make, make it uh, happen using my intent. So it's got to come about because um, I can't resist it. You know, that's how I feel about it. So before, um, when I wrote a book, um, it was a, the first one was prompted by my daughter. She found my diaries. I would never have written if she hadn't struggled reading it. So that came about through an impulse then I had my 10-minute moment, which was almost written for me because of the intensity of the experience in Scotland. And I couldn't resist it. It was just so, so powerful. Then when I, when I wrote uh, um, Vistas of Infinity, again, there was an inner sort of urge because I felt there were so many things which were unsaid, left unsaid. So I wanted to round things up. Now that is now nearly seven years ago. And I've been, I started writing, but it didn't, it didn't have the power behind it. There was too much intent. And when I felt intent was coming, I put it to a, to one side straight away, and so my focus now shifted to my visual things at the moment. But I don't know what's going to happen, you know. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> well, my my meditation technique, breathing, was always sort of secondary. My breathing followed naturally when I for, when I started uh, getting sort of into myself. You know, the thing is, I never really started off as a technique. I was always a little bit more uh, interested in, um, in in having a dynamic experience from the inside out. Okay, so I never really had a teacher either. You know, the only teacher I had was at the beginning when I learned transcendental meditation. You know, mm -hmm. and and then. Um, I I read a lot of books on meditation and things, but I never really followed the technique. And that started when I uh, had my first out-of-body experience where I met a, a, a master, a teacher, this Chinese guy, okay? And what he did was, as I talked to him, I sort of, I was in awe of his presence, so I sort of bowed down before him, and he was sort of in a very casual position, and he sort of uh, pushed me away and said, "Don't be silly, you know." And then, but as we as we ke kept on talking, he was still sitting in the same position. I was kneeling in front of him, and he started rubbing my chest with his foot, 
And I thought this is really odd. I felt it slightly sort of embarrassed almost. <laughs> but but I noticed as he was rubbing my chest with his foot grinning that I had an incredible burning in my chest. An incredible burning and, and a very, very powerful, uh, blissful experience. And the thing was, after I came out of the out-of-body experience, I had this this burning lasted for three weeks. And the only way I could describe it was an incredible laugh, I felt, you know. And and to me, that was the, the crucial thing. And also, at that time, I also had the emergence of what I call my silent companion, a feeling of a presence in my life that was walking next beside me. You know, I couldn't put my finger on it, what it was, but it would never actually uh, say anything or speak to me, but it was almost as if somebody was walking next to me. You know, and and I think that sometimes people talk about mediums and other people like yourself, sometimes people talk about their guardian angels or something. I didn't have any any idea of angels at that time when this phenomena started. I didn't even believe in angels, to tell you the truth. I was a very skeptical guy. So I, I attributed it to, to a higher state of myself, a presence, you know, which, which was there, but I couldn't put my finger down. But then something interesting happened. This presence was only there <clears throat> when I um, when I was sort of kind of innocent. The moment I I I was selfish or mean or, or egotistical or arrogant, any of these negative personal traits, it went. It was no longer there. And, and to me, that was a teaching aspect of this presence because it purified my, my lower nature, okay? Because I felt the absence of it and I felt, oh, oh, I immediately was aware that I've done something which was unpleasant, even if it was only to myself, okay? So, so this became my teacher in life. Okay, and then later on, as I developed the relationship with this teaching aspect, I could ask questions, but it wouldn't give me a direct answer. It would just lead me into a space where I had to sort of uh, remain in, and I would get the answer then. You know, there could be quite, quite practical answers, or it could be answers which came much later by itself. Mm -hmm. You know, so this was my teacher, this this aspect, and um, and then when I went to Scotland, which was some forty years later or so, you know, which was in two thousand thirteen, <clears throat> I realized that this aspect was actually who I was. That was my higher self. Yeah, okay. I was going to ask you that. I was going to say that. Yeah, and it disappeared. I I, I was it. Okay, and that was incredible. There was, I came home, I was myself for the first time. And, and I had this experience of meeting myself before on various occasions where I was, I remember one occasion when I was afraid of it. I, f I felt it, but I thought, oh, you know, I, I wonder what that is. You know, I don't want to see it. You know, I had a little bit of fear, okay? And then I suddenly went through this barrier and said, oh, it's me, that's my real me, mm -hmm. okay? And then it stopped again. And so, so this came, you know, sporadically. Mm 